I've given a few talks in the past at Mellenkoff on large colon polyps and colon resection, colon identification. That was all well before the pandemic, and now we're past that, right? So we're back again. This is the assessment and classification of large colon polyps. My disclosures today are Boston Scientific and Exact Sciences. In an outline of my talk, the assessment of the large colon polyp, review classification systems, and the management algorithm for large colon polyps. So as I talked about before, um, the colon adenoma adenocarcinoma pathway is one that I think many of us in gastroenterology are familiar with. You go from having a normal colon, hyperproliferation, you develop a pop that grows in size from say small, medium to large, you then develop an adenocarcinoma, and then it becomes an invasive cancer, which can then metastasize and spread to other parts of the body. And for those of us who perform colonoscopy, I think we're pretty good at recognizing small polyps, right? We see these little lesions, we say these are benign you know, adenomatous polyps, we take them out. No big deal, these are pretty straightforward. Similarly, I think we're pretty good at identifying cancer, right? So you see these types of lesions in the colonoscopy, you say, this is cancer, this is a mass, you biopsy it, you get your cancer diagnosis, you move on. So those are pretty easy. I think the hard part is when you come across something in between, right? Not the small popping you take out with forceps or a cold snare, not the large cancer that's obstructing the colon or causing a lot of bleeding. It's these guys here, right? These are the one, two centimeter polyps. Maybe they're a little larger. Um, they have some features about them that look a little more concerning and not that simple and straightforward. What do you do with this? Is this a large colon polyp or is it cancer? How do you make that decision? And what are you going to do about this patient when you're in there doing the procedure? That's what I want to talk to you guys about today. So assessment of a large colon polyp. I think when you see a large colon polyp, you think a lot of things right away, right? You assess the polyp, you say, look, how big is it? What's the shape of this thing? Where is it located? Where am I in the colon? And then the orientation relative to your scope. So is the polyp small or large, right? You can decide how big it is in terms of centimeters, but you know, quickly off the bat, you're thinking, is this something that I can take off pretty easily? Or is it something that's much bigger? It's going to take a lot more work. The shape, is it pedunculated or is it flat or sessile? Location, where am I in the colon? Am I in the IC valve, by the appendiceal orifice, in the rectum, or anywhere in between? And then the orientation, which you can't really appreciate in a picture, but for those of us who, who perform colonoscopy, sometimes the pop's in a very easy position to remove. Sometimes it's really hard to get the scope in a position where you can remove the polyp easily. The pop may not even be that big, but because the colon is very loopy or tortuous, it may be very difficult to position the polyp to remove it. But I want to move on to a more existential question here. Do looks really matter? And I will answer this question when it comes to relationships. That's for you guys to figure out for yourselves. But let's talk about colon polyps and, whether or not, when, and how they really look and how does it really matter. So when you're assessing a large colon polyp, rather than thinking just about shape, size, location, orientation, you want to think, look at things like surface pattern, morphology, or shape of the polyp, and then histology, right? So we'll go through these assessments. There are classification systems for all of them. It's hard to memorize all these things, but I just wanted to go through some of the basics, things that you should try to take away from this talk. So let's talk about the surface pattern of the colon polyp. So there's the NICE classification, and then there's the Kudo pit pattern classification. So the NICE classification is pretty simple and straightforward to use. It's called, it's NICE is abbreviated for Narrow Band Imaging International Colorectal Endoscopic Classification. It's three criteria based on color, vessels, and surface pattern. And there's types one through three. And this basically uses uh, narrow band imaging, which is a proprietary filter on many Olympus scopes, helps you classify these types of polyps. So looking at type one, the color is typically same or lighter than the background. I mean, the polyp is same or lighter than the background color. There are no superficial vessels. And the surface pattern is dark, uniform spots, or it looks fairly homogeneous. In this scenario, the most likely pathology is a hyperplastic polyp. So here are some pictures. There's a polyp under white light, the same polyp under narrowband imaging. Again, here's another polyp with narrowband imaging. It looks very smooth, homogeneous. Here's another one that looks uh, it's got these little round spots, but again, it's very uh, simple, straightforward. Um, very, uh, they look very similar appearing. Uh, nothing concerning about these, these features, right? So this, these are all pictures of hyperplastic pops. You can appreciate either on the white light or in their narrow band imaging. 
You can see also the, how they're lighter colored than say the, the background mucosa. Then there's the type two. The color is brown relative to the background. There are brown vessels surrounding the white structures. And then there's oval, tubular, or branched white structure surrounded by brown vessels. And these are your typical adenomas. And it's what we looked at yesterday we during the live course when we were assessing that polyp that was in the rectum. So again, polyp under white light, but narrow band imaging, you start to see these, this brown color, right? You see these little, what I call kind of brainy appearance, but these are these tubular structures that you can see on the surface of the colon polyp. And so here, here are some additional pictures of adenomas under narrow band imaging. And again, you kind of appreciate, or you can kind of, um, as you do this more and more, become familiar with these images, you can quickly appreciate what an adenoma looks like and what is a benign precancerous polyp. So ultimately you got the type three. So type three is brown to dark brown. So it's getting darker in color. You have disruption or missing vessels and there's an amorphous or absent surface pattern. So it's not that brainy appearance. It's not that smooth appearance. And these are gonna be more concerning for a deep semicosal invasive cancer. Again, here are some images. Here's what looks like a large polyp. But when you get up close and you put narrowband imaging on it, you start to see that the superficial vessels are kind of disrupted there. You lose that, um, that kind of brainy appearance, those tubular structures. It starts to get a little crowded. And this is more concerning for a cancer. So even though this lesion is not very big, it's likely an invasive cancer. Here's some additional pictures of polyps that are uh, concerning for, for deep submucosal invasion, generally an early cancer. So you see this picture on the left under white, high definition white light. It may look like a large flat polyp. You look on their narrow band imaging, you look at it closer, and you start to see that there's disruption of those superficial vessels along the surface of the polyp concerning for cancer. And yet another example here, and this is a very small polyp, right? But when you look at it closer, you start to appreciate on the far right there, uh, let me see it really, 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 very well up there, but, um, you start to appreciate that these features are concerning for cancer. The other uh, superficial pattern you can, uh, you can use is the kudo pit pattern. Uh, this is used more in the east. You have to use magnifications, which we don't typically use here. Um, and then use a contrast dye rather than using um, the, uh, the filter narrowband imaging. So we don't typically use this pattern, but in the east they do. And they have these five different classifications you know, one is normal, two is hyperplastic, three and four adenomas, and then five, when you start to see this irregular arrangement um, of the superficial pit pattern or loss or decrease of the pits with the morphous structure, you start worrying about, again, cancer. So the surface pattern of the polyps you want to look at, you use a nice classification to differentiate between a hyperplastic polyp, an adenoma, or say, deeply submucosal invasive cancer. We're going to move on to morphology or looking at the general shape of the polyp. And there are a few classifications here the Paris classification, the laterally spreading tumor, and the non lifting sign. So, the Paris classification is an endoscopic classification for superficial colorectal lesions. There's three major superficial morphologies, and they break this down into one polypoid, two non polypoid, three excavated. Okay? So, polypoid gets differentiated into pedunculator or 1P. Sessile is 1S. For the non polypoid or sessile lesions, you can get minimally elevated, which is a 2A, truly flat, a 2B, next, uh, mini, minimally depressed, which is a 2C, and then the third type, which is excavated or an ulcerated lesion. Um, and you can get a combination of these things, right? So you can get a 2A plus C, which is what we took out yesterday in the rectum there. It's a minimally elevated with uh, some, maybe some central depression. Um, but you can have combinations of these features. So you don't have to have just one, you have to characterize all polyps as one of these things. A laterally spreading tumor. This is just a description of, of polyps that kind of spread laterally as opposed to going deep into the submucosa. And they're described as either being granular, you know, they're kind of bumpy appearing versus non granular or very smooth. The non granular polyps tend to have a higher risk of invasion or cancer. And then there's a non lifting sign. This is where you inject fluid under the polyp, but it fails to lift the lesion. And it suggests deep submucosal invasion, especially if there's been no prior attempt at resection. But it can also be seen in fibrosis from polyps that have been previously biopsied, cauterized, or tattooed. So you got to be careful. If you see this non-lifting sign, you have to think about was this previously intervened on or not? Because if it has, 
just because there's a non-lifting sign does not necessarily mean that it's an invasive cancer. So this was actually a pop that was a polyp that was sent to me to remove. Uh, and I said, this is clearly a cancer to me. There's no way I'm removing this, but just to prove my point, I took a picture of me trying to inject this thing and it's not lifting, right? The water, the saline is spreading back at me rather than going underneath the pop and lifting it. Uh, but this was just like I sent back to the referring physician saying, this is not a pop that can be removed. This needs to be surgically resected. And lastly, histology. And obviously you're not gonna know histology at the time of your procedure, but I think it's important to go over some of these classifications as well. Uh, Cause after you take the polyp out, you may get these reports about the histology and you gotta make decisions about what to do for the patient. So the two classifications here are the Hagee classification and the Kakuchi. The Hagee classification, I think, is most useful for pedunculated polyps. So basically, it shows that if cancer is invading into the submucosa, that's this layer here in yellow. So in this big pedunculated polyp, level zero means that the cancer is essentially just in the tip of the polyp. It's basically a, a carcinoma in situ or high-grade dysplasia. Level one means that the cancer is now invading into the head of the polyp, level two is into the neck, three is into the stock, and now four, you're basically into the semicosal bed. But we'll talk later about what this means in terms of management, depending on how invasive this cancer is. But you, know, you can imagine if you take a polyp out at a level, level one or two, and you take off the stock with a clean margin, you essentially resected the cancer completely, right? Obviously, there's some, some concern about semicosal invasion, but be given the pedunculated shape of this polyp, maybe less concerned about uh, deep invasion, metast metastatic disease, the lymph nodes, and elsewhere. With sessile polyps, essentially, if you have a cancer that's invading the semicosa, it's, it's already invasive. It's already essentially level four. The Kuchi classification breaks down semicosa involvement into three levels, one, two, and three, depending on if you're in the top third, the middle third, or the deep third. This becomes less relevant in colonoscopy because we don't typically do full thickness resection. So we don't know if we're in the top third, middle third, or distal third, deep third of the submucosa. Um, but they have used other classifications considering if you're at, say, uh, less than one millimeter deep into the submucosa, that's considered superficial. We'll talk more about that as well. But it gets at this point, which is depending on the depth of submucosal invasion, uh, it may affect your management for the patient. So these are the classifications. I know it's a lot to remember. I don't think a lot of people remember these classifications when you're doing a colonoscopy. Which classification am I thinking about? What am I doing? What should I do here? So I wanna break this down and make it a little bit easier for you guys. So again, do looks really matter? I, I think for colon polyps, it does, okay? For, for relationships, who knows? But the careful assessment of the polyp appearance is essential. And you wanna examine the surface pattern and morphology as we just discussed. And this will help determine if the colon polyp is benign or malignant. So malignant polyp is a colorectal polyp with neoplastic invasion of the submucosa without extension into the musculus propria. That's the definition of a malignant polyp, not a cancer or, or a mass, uh, it's a malignant polyp. It's consider, it can also be called a submucosally invasive polyp. And based on the AJCC colon cancer staging criteria, this is colon cancer based on tumor depth. So here's involving the mucosa muscular mucosa. This is a T1S versus in situ, T1 lesion into the submucosa, T2 now going through the muscular propria. T3 means you're basically at the level of cirrhosis or beyond. Four means you're essentially going through the wall of the colon, invading adjacent organs. And so a malignant polyp would be defined as a T1 lesion, basically going into the submucosal space. So when you approach a large colon polyp, you want, you want to decide, is the polyp pedunculated or not? If it's pedunculated, you can go ahead and try to remove it endoscopically but you wanna take it off on block at the base of the stalk. If it's non-pedunculated, you go to the next question, which is, does the polyp have endoscopic features of deep submucosal invasion? So deep submucosal invasion is defined as greater than one millimeter of invasion into the submucosa. Endoscopic features are highly specific. So you're looking at the nice type three classifications, the kudo pit pattern, ulceration or depression of the lesion surface, and if you see a non-lifting sign. So these are signs of deep submucosal invasion. If you see that, there's a 10 to 18% risk of residual disease in the bowel wall and or lymph node metastases after endoscopic resection. And so it usually requires surgery, uh, resection, surgical resection and referral to one of our colorectal surgeons. 
For a superficial submucosal invasion, this is defined as having less than one millimeter of invasion into the submucosa. However, there are no endoscopic signs that are highly sensitive or specific for this. But features of a pulp that may suggest superficial submucosal invasion include size greater than two centimeters, location in the right colon of the rectosigmoid colon, a laterally spreading tumor that's granular with a large discrete nodule, or a, or a laterally spreading tumor that's non-granular or smooth in appearance. So these are suggestive, but not really definitive for a superficial submucosal invasion. These lesions can be removed endoscopically, and endoscopic recession can be curative. So the 0 to 4% risk of lymph node metastases and adjuvant therapy, including surgery, may be necessary pending the final histologic results. But the idea is to take it out, you get the histology, and then you can make a decision as to whether or not this, can be, this needs to be further resected with surgery or if it can be just watched with surveillance. So does the pop have endoscopic features of deep submucosal invasion? It does. Then you biopsy it, you tattoo it, you stage it, you get surgery involved. If not, you can consider endoscopic resection. So this is a paper that was published in Gastroenterology. It's the Endoscopic Recognition and Management Strategies for Malignant Colorectal Polyps. This is the U.S. Multi-Society Task Force on Colorectal Cancer. It's a guideline that tells you how to assess lesions for endoscopic features associated with malignant polyps and a guide for endoscopic management of these polyps. So, and it outlines factors to advise surgery versus surveillance. So here's the algorithm. So you have a lesion, it's pedunculated or it's not. If it's pedunculated, you try to attempt an on-block resection to so take off the polyp at the base when possible. If it's benign, you go to surveillance. That's simple and straightforward. But if it shows some mucosal cancer in the pedunculated polyp, if the site has favorable histology or unfavorable histology, an unfavorable histology is defined as invasion of the stalk, so the Hagit 4 classification. The tumor is within two millimeters of the resection margin. You have poor tumor differentiation, or you have poorly differentiated adenocarcinoma, or you have lymphovascular invasion seen on your pathology. If you have favorable histology, if you have none of these features, then you can go to surveillance. You can watch this thing just like any other polyp. If unfavorable histology, the recommendation is to go to surgery. This is for pedunculated polyps. Now we're going to move to large non-pedunculated polyps. Okay, these are polyps greater than a centimeter in size that are not pedunculated, so sessile or flat. You can split this into the nice one or two classification on one side versus the lesions that are more likely to be cancerous. So a nice one or two lesion, the recommendation would be to try to attempt to remove it endoscopically. So if you're going to remove it, you can go ahead and do it. But if you're not going to completely remove the lesion, then don't touch it, okay? Don't touch it. You can tattoo away from it, far away from it. But don't go and mess with the polyp because it'll make it harder for the next doctor to take this thing out. But the idea is you can remove these lesions if you think it's a benign lesion. Now, if you're not going to remove it, refer to interventional endoscopy. If you have a lesion that you suspect is an early cancer, it's got deep submucosal invasion for the features we looked at, described already, then you're going to biopsy the lesion and tattoo it, and you're going to refer to surgery. If you're not sure if the lesion is malignant, send it to an interventional endoscopist to take a look. Okay, you could potentially prevent the patient from having to go to surgery. I know we have two surgeons on the panel up here, but... I think they would agree. And Dr. Kazanja and Dr. Lynn are actually very thoughtful about this. They've had plenty of patients where they've been referred for surgery. They look at the pictures of the colonoscopy and tell us, hey, can you guys remove this thing endoscopically? If not, we'll take it out with surgery, but maybe it would prevent this patient from getting surgery. Okay. So learning is an active process. We learn by doing. Only knowledge that is used sticks in our mind, right? This is like all the residency training for me. You can read all the books you want in medical school. You don't know anything, right? Until you go to residency and I should have to implement that inpatient care and then it really sticks. So since we learned all this stuff, I figured we'd do a couple of cases. So 79 year woman undergoes colonoscopy for routine colon polyp surveillance. In the proximal colon, proximal transverse colon, this one centimeter polyp is seen. Looks simple enough. It's a Paris classification 1S, right? It's like a mound, it's a cell polyp. What would you do? A, resect the polyp, B, refer to interventional endoscopy, or C, would you biopsy, tattoo, staging CT scan, and refer to surgery? 
All right, so 86% of you guys would resect the polyp. That's great. Love that. 13% would refer to interventional endoscopy. And then 6% would had to send the surgery. Okay. So the physician decides that he's going to take this thing out. So he lifts the polyp, but realizes that it's bigger than he initially thought. There's that picture. He said, he sent me this picture. He lifted it with methylene blue. He's like, oh boy, this is bigger than what I thought initially. See the image? I'm going to ask you guys again. Now what are you going to do? Resect the polyp? You're going to bail, refer to interventional endoscopy? Or are you going to really bail and do a biopsy, tattoo, CT, and surgery? All right, so some of you guys are like, okay, I'm not taking this out anymore. I'm going to refer it out. I like that. And a larger percent now are also considering surgery. So the polyp is referred to interventional endoscopy given the size. So here's my endoscopy. Here's the lesion again. And look at it more carefully. It's not just this round lesion on top. It's got this slightly depressed segment to it to the left, right? So if you see the picture on the right, not only is the pop there in the center, but you've got this part of the pop that's a little bit depressed. And then there's more pop even beyond that. Here's it in narrow band imaging. And it looks a little abnormal, I'd say, right? If you look at it carefully, you start to see that you don't have those tubular structures. There's a little bit of that, that, that centrally depressed area. It doesn't look that uh, well organized. So I decided to remove it endoscopically. There is the EMR site. And here are the pathology results. Polyp, proximal transverse colon, invasive adenocarcinoma, low grade arising within a sesalcerate adenoma with high grade cytologic dysplasia. Of course, this came with a lot of comments. Locally, there is invasion into the superficial submucosa. The pop appears sessile and invasive tumor extends to within less than two millimeters of the cauterized dissection margin. No lymphovascular invasion is seen. So patients referred to oncology. The CA is 1.7, CT scan is all negative. And after discussion with the colorectal surgeon, the patient actually decides to go proceed with a right hemicolectomy. But again, if you go back, this is a, a superficial submucosal invasion, invasion of a polyp, right? So undergo surgery, and the final pathology results show no residual carcinoma. 35 lymph nodes negative for metastatic carcinoma. This is a thick Sanjian's patient, actually. Um, but no cancer was seen, right? But I think the patient felt more comfortable getting surgery to be more definitive about what this lesion was. But it was a superficial invasive polyp, um, had cancer in it, but again, the risk is very low of having lymph node metastases or residual cancer, uh, somewhere around between zero to 4%. So here's example number two, 57 year old man undergoes a screening colonoscopy. This lesion is seen, I think in the rectum. I'd call this a 2A plus C, right? You can appreciate there's that little centrally depressed area in the middle of this polyp as well. It's not a big polyp, it just looks a little funny, right? The area in the, in the center is depressed. I think you can appreciate the edges look like a typical adenomatous polyp, but the center, maybe not so much. So what would you do for this polyp? We'll pull you again, same answer choices. Resect the polyp, refer to dimensional endoscopy, or treat it as a cancer. Okay, so it's almost split between refer to dimensional endoscopy or refer to surgery. I think those are reasonable choices. This one was referred to me to evaluate for endoscopic resection. So here's this polyp again. I'm examining it, looking at the surface mucosa, the surface pit pattern. For the most part, the edges look like a typical adenoma. And I say these things, but even I have a tough time sometimes deciding if this is a benign polyp or an early cancer, right? I don't think it's that easy to tell. As I mentioned to you before, there are no specific or sensitive signs endoscopically for a superficial mucosal invasive cancer. For deep submucosal invasion, there are some features that you know, make you more concerned. But this, to me, looked kind of on the fence. So I'm looking at it and examining it under white light, MBI, I said, you know what, I'm gonna try to take this thing off. So I lifted it first, right? So if it lifts, then I, I, I have at least I can attempt to remove it. 
to get final histology. So even if, I, if I'm not sure, if I take this thing off, it turns out to be cancer, you still go to surgery, right? So at least I'll get them a diagnosis. But here I am lifting this polyp, and it's lifting actually quite well, including the center. So there it is, nicely lifted. Even the center lifted very well. Here comes a snare. I'm going to attempt an on block resection, right? For histology's sake, I want to take this off in one piece. Kind of like yesterday, we talked about taking a larger snare if needed to take this polyp out in one piece if possible. Certainly, if the polyp was even larger, I may not be able to remove it on block, but this one I want to get a deep margin, lateral margins. And you can see how with the lift, I was able to get underneath the polyp, take it off in one piece, and you see this nice, clean EMR site. Right, looked really clean. To me, it didn't look like there was any evidence of kind of deep cancer in there. So the pathology results, tubular villus adenoma with foci of high-grade dysplasia. Not surprising to me, I thought those at least have some invasive cancer in it. I mean, high-grade dysplasia, I guess some people would call that, you know, carcinoma in situ, but there's no evidence of carcinoma, right? So this patient was, did not need a surgery, this was a benign lesion, and we can do routine surveillance endoscopically. I think it goes to show, though, if you're not sure, I think consider setting it out for one of us to try to remove interventional endoscopy. If you're sure that it's a cancer, yeah, of course, treat it as a cancer, take your biopsy, prove that it's cancer, and get it, to, you know, do the, do the right thing. So my final conclusions from the talk today, endoscopic assessment of large colon polyps can determine if it, the lesion is benign versus malignant, deep versus superficial submucosal invasion, pedunculated lesions should be removed on block, and non pedunculate lesions without features of deep submucosal invasion can potentially be removed endoscopically. Thank you.